Our first reading for this morning comes from 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 4 through 8. So listen for what the Holy Spirit is telling God's people. But he, Elijah, the prophet Elijah, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die. It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. Suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Get up and eat. He looked, and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him, and said, Get up and eat or the journey will be too much for you. He got up and ate and drank. Then he went in the strength of that food, 40 days and 40 nights, to Horeb, the Mount of God. Our second lesson this morning comes from the gospel, not the gospel, excuse me, from the epistle of Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 25, all the way through chapter 5, verse 2. So listen once more for the word of God. So then, putting away falsehood, let each of you speak the truth with your neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not make room for the devil. Those who steal, must give up stealing. Rather, let them labor, doing good work with their own hands so as to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is good for building up, as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with which you were marked with a seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander, together with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Holy wisdom, holy word, thanks be to God. I'd like to talk with you just for a time this morning about the centrality of faith formation in the life and ministry of the church. And I'd like to share some of the important work that's being done in our committees and our session, uh, that the things that they are doing to ensure that this is a place where not only all people are welcome to gather, but where all people can grow in their faith together as one. I'm so very thankful for the many, many, many people who invest their time and their energy and their their personal faith in helping us learn and grow together. And, And if we're honest with ourselves, it takes a lot of people. It takes a lot of people to make this happen if we're doing it right. And I'm grateful Grateful for the many people who served this past week, served the children, uh, our children and the children of our community at Vacation Bible School, helping them learn and grow together, uh, understanding a little bit more about God's plan to restore all things and, and how we as a people might also partner with God to accomplish that. I'm grateful for the folks who who care for the youngest among us, even now downstairs in the nursery or on Wednesday evenings as well. 
For those who, who nurture the faith of our kids and our youth and our adults by teaching and facilitating Sunday school discussions. And for those who serve in Kingdom Kids and youth and adults each and every week uh, at Kirk Night discussions as well. I'm grateful for all of you. But I will say that the days, I think, the days are gone when faith formation only happens on Sunday mornings and Wednesday evenings. Those days are gone. The days are gone when faith formation only happens within the confines of church classrooms, here or in other churches. Those days are gone. The days are gone when faith formation only happens when the preacher opens his or her mouth in Sunday morning worship. Those days are gone because we know. We know that we grow in our faith in all sorts of ways, at all sorts of times, in all sorts of places. By, by reading and studying the scriptures, by singing songs together, by praying our prayers, by visiting with people in hospital and home, by, by serving in our community, by chatting in the hallways or in fellowship halls over coffee and donuts or cookies, and by living together as families day in and day out around dining room tables. We know that. We know that any time, any time we can spend together dialoguing and talking about our faith, that is time well spent. That is good for us. And it's why Pastor Amanda and I commit ourselves to, to preaching on the same lesson that many of you have already talked about today in our Sunday school classes, kids and youth and adults alike. Many of you have already talked about this particular text. And it's why, we re, it's why we revisit these texts on Monday morning as well at the Second Cup. Because we hope that the, the different nuances of the text pop up each and every time we open the pages of our Bibles and each and every time we discuss these stories together as a body. Whether we're in Sunday school or in worship or in Kirk Night or even in our own private, the privacy of our own homes. The more we engage in these texts, these Bible stories, the more we engage in them, the more we engage our faith with other people, the more we are shaped to be the one family of God that we are called to be. And we hope, we hope that there will be good fruit that comes from this. We hope that there will be some good cross-pollination going on here in this place. We hope that you're interacting with one another, that you are sharing with one another things that you're thinking about, things that you are experiencing, things that you are learning together. So my challenge to you is this. Grown-ups, talk to one another. See what's going on in the life of other people. See what others are thinking about and be open to listening and learning with one another. Talk to our kids. Talk to our youth. Ask them what they are thinking about and experiencing and learning about their faith. Be open to hearing from them. And kids and youth, you can do the same thing. This is not just a grown-up thing. This is for all of us. Kids and youth, talk to your Sunday school teachers and your Kingdom Kids leaders and your youth advisor and ask them questions and share your thoughts and experiences with them as well. Because we know that we need each other to grow in our faith. We do this thing together. And we know that this is not an old person thing. This is not a young person thing. This is for us all, young and old alike. We know that we can indeed learn and grow together. But the most important thing, the most important thing about faith formation is not getting everything right. It's not having all the answers. It's not knowing all the stories. It's not memorizing all of the right Bible verses. It's really none of those things. But rather, the most important thing about faith formation here in this place is that we become a community of curiosity, 
a community of wonder, a community of engagement and growth, and dare I say, a community of copycats, if I'm going to bring back a term from the old schoolyard days. I hope that we would be a community of copycats. I'll explain. I can't help but think of my time at First Presbyterian Church of Monticello, Florida. It was my first call, a little small church, wonderful people. If any of you are watching at any time, we miss you all. When I was a graduate student at Florida State, I also served this small little church uh, on a half-time basis as if there is a, such a thing as a half-time pastor. But by the time I started at the church, they had been without a pastor for more than three years, which just goes to show, as an aside, just how difficult it is for really truly small congregations in this day and age. And maybe there's something in it that we can do to support young and small congregations among us as well, especially in this ever-changing world. But of course, at this small church, First Presbyterian Church of Monticello, their families had gone. There were no young families, so there were no kids. And they couldn't offer any Sunday school classes for the kids who weren't there. And because there were no classes for kids, the adults stopped coming to Sunday school as well. So no classes for adults. And Wednesday evenings stopped dwindling in attendance until there were none. Truly, they did other things to connect with one another, spending time in fellowship together, but there was very little dedicated time spent discussing faith and life together as a people. So changing this trend, it was one of the first things that we knew we had to do. It's one of the first things that the session and I worked on and did together. An older gentleman volunteered to teach a children's Sunday school class for what was my kids, the only kids there. So young Jude and young Asher have very fond memories of Mr. Lamar, who sat with them each and every week and shared with them. And even now, to this day, he still sends them birthday cards in the mail and oftentimes gives them a call on their birthday to wish them well. And at the same time, as these kids were meeting, a few adults decided, hey, we better start meeting as well. And they gathered together in the Ruby Braswell room on Sunday morning to have conversations about the scriptures. And then we started to meet once more on Wednesday evenings and had more biblical studies discussions because we knew, we knew we had to make a commitment to take and claim time for these faithful discussions so that everyone could continue to connect and grow and learn and figure out their faith together. But I also think about my youngest, Amos, who is with uh, spending some much needed time with grandma and grandpa but he was a bit young during these years at my start in Monticello, not quite two years old. And being such a small congregation, the, they couldn't really afford nursery care at both the Sunday school hour and at the worship hour. And so, so I would watch Amos before worship every Sunday. I would be preparing myself, getting my own thoughts in order, looking over my materials for worship, and Amos would play. He would play with Play-Doh, he would color pictures, he would cook me delicious food on the play kitchen in the corner, and, and then inevitably, each and every Sunday, <coughs> he would go over to the bookshelf and he would ask me to read him a book. Each and every week, without fail, each and every week, without fail, he looked for the same book. Kids do this sometimes. And when he found it, he would take it off the shelf and he would bring it over to me with joy in his eyes and a huge brightness about his face. And after I had finished all of my preparation, I would sit him on my lap and I would read him this book, same book, every week for months and months and months. It was called, it was called the Copy Kitten. 
And it's still out there if you want to pick a copy up. It's a story about a little kitten, a copy kitten, who lives on a farm. And the cat, this little kitten, roams around the farm and he decides that he wants to be one of the other farm animals. So he copies them. Everyone he encounters, he he copies them, doing what they're doing and saying what they are saying, copying all of the farm animals except Mama Cat. And then when the circus comes into town, he cruises over there and he wanders around the circus and he starts copying all of those animals as well, doing what they're doing and saying what they're saying. He does this all over the farm, all over the circus until he meets the giraffe. And he simply cannot copy the giraffe with his long, long neck. So the kitten makes a decision, makes a decision to return home so that he can be himself, a kitten, a mom, a kitten of his mom. And you know, Amos and I, we read that story. We read that story week in and week out for months on end. And so when this text from Ephesians pops up, I just cannot help but think about Amos in that book, sitting on my lap those Sunday mornings. Problem is, the the moral of that story, the copy kitten, is to to be yourself, right? To find yourself, to to be different from everyone else, to follow the beat of your own drum. That's what this little kitten does. And you don't need me to tell you that this has become a problem in our own society. Everybody wanting to discover who they are, that's a good thing. But when taken to the extremes, it's led to this hyper-individualized world where everyone's out to serve themselves and get their own needs met. And in the worst case scenarios, that comes at the expense of others. But our text this morning from Ephesians says something different. Something quite different, quite opposite, as a matter of fact. While the copy kitten speaks about individuality, being who you really are, our text this morning calls us to be a community of copycats, to be much more like one another than being individuals. We are members of one another, writes the author. We are members of one another. We are one people. So we are to act like we are one people, the author suggests. And I don't know about you, but how do you be members of one another? That seems like it's pretty hard. How are we to act as one people? How are we to act as we are one members of one another? That seems really, really challenging. And the author of the Ephesians spells that out for us by offering us what I call the list. The list of all the do's and don'ts. It's all of these do's and don'ts, these behavioral prescriptions that give people, in my mind, the really wrong idea of what the church is really about, what the church really does. What is the church? It's a place of rules and regulations, people might think. What is the church all about? It's about making sure you do good stuff and don't do bad stuff. That's maybe part of it, but there's so much more. So much emphasis is placed upon these do's and don'ts then, and the author just doesn't help us today to try to fight the and change our society's perception of what the church has to offer. It just launches into the list. Put away falsehood, writes. Speak the truth. Be angry, but do not sin. Deal with your anger in a timely manner. Give up stealing and work honestly. Do not speak evilly, but speak in such a way as to build one another up. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Put away your bitterness, your wrath, your anger, your wrangling, your slander, your malice. Be kind. Be tender-hearted. Forgive one another. It's a laundry list. 
not comprehensive in, nation, in nature, but it is a laundry list of do's and don'ts. And if I read that list, and if I am honest with you, I'll let you in on a, another little secret. I don't get that list right all the time. Don't ask my family. I suspect that you don't get everything on that list right all the time either. Maybe you do, but I suspect otherwise. And you know, we can get caught up in that. We can get caught up in the rules game. It's so easy to do, so easy to do. We focus on the do's and don'ts, the shoulds and should nots, the cans and can'ts, the wills and won'ts, the mays and may nots. We can focus on all of that, but here's the thing. All of these do's and don'ts, all of these rules and regulations, they all point to the one and only thing that really, really matters. They all point to the therefore. Therefore, be imitators of God, the author writes. Therefore, be a community of copycats. That list of rules and regulations, they're not, they're not about judgment. They're not about measuring our self-worth. They're not about measuring our faithfulness. They are guidelines for us. The most important thing here is to imitate God as beloved children and to copy Christ who offered himself up for us. That's what this author wants to say to us today. Therefore, we are a community of copycats, a people called to imitate Christ, who put away his own ambition in order to offer himself up on our behalf. What better model could there be for a community of faith? What better call could there be for us to be a people whose faith is formed so that we look not to our own interests, but to the interests of others? A people who are formed to consider others to be just as or more important than ourselves. A people formed to give ourselves up for the good of the gospel. Our hopes, our dreams, our desires taking a back seat to God's hopes and dreams and desires. This is how we become members of one another. This is how we become a community of copycats. And this, this is what faith formation at North Wilkesboro Presbyterian Church is all about. Our call to be a community of copycats. Therefore, go. Go and imitate God. Go and copy Christ. Go and be like one another in faith and in love. Thanks be to God. Amen. And friends, now we go. We go out into the world that God so dearly and deeply loves, a world that desperately needs the love and grace and mercy of Christ. Therefore, go. Go and be imitators of God. Go and be copycats of Christ, giving yourselves up for a world in need, just as Christ gave himself up for us. Go and be the body of Christ for a world that needs the body of Christ. And as you go, I pray you go with this blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus the Christ, may the love of God our Creator, and may the partnership of the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life. May that God go with you and with me and with us together this day and forevermore. Alleluia. Amen.